hello, Perry Marshall here. I'm here with Joanna Xavier and Paul, Paul Nelson. Paul Nelson, longtime friend of Perry. Just getting to know Joanna, but I'm thrilled that she's joining us. And me too. Joanna and I had a conversation on my podcast a few months ago. We talked about origin of life and all kinds of things like that. And Paul uh, writes for the blog on the Discovery Institute. And Paul noticed that uh, Joanna, you and I had talked about Stephen Meyer's book, Signature in the Cell. And, uh, and we talked about the, intelli the intelligent design movement, the design paradigm. And so there was his blog post, which is interesting and we'll link to in the show notes. And then that led to a, some emails between all of us and we just decided this would be a great um, opportunity for a conversation. So let, let me frame this. You know, some people will know everything that I'm going to say, but a lot of people wouldn't. Um, so I'll just paint some background. So if you go back 15 plus years to when I was new in the evolution space, what was going on at the time was there was this very bitter blood match between intelligent design people who got quite a bit of attention in the early 2000s. There was a Dover top trial about intelligent design in the Dover Public Schools in Delaware. Um, George, uh, the, the president was talking about teach the controversy and it's made some people upset. And so it, it was a very, very, very polarized world. Yeah. And, um, and I stepped into that. In fact, it was probably at its fever pitch when I showed up. Yeah, I would agree with that. And Paul's, Paul's been in it longer. And um, what a lot of people don't know is that intelligent design is a very big tent. Yes. Like if you actually go to intelligent design meetings, um, it's quite a spectrum. It's a huge spectrum. Yeah. And if you <laughs> sit down at some, if you get your cup of coffee in and sit down with some random person, you're going to have to talk to them for five or 10 minutes to figure out what they really think about anything. <laughs> um, and it's, it's not like there's just one or two flavors of intelligent design person. There are people who believe that intelligent design means um, God snapped his fingers and there was a miracle and a zebra appeared munching grass on the savanna and, th and th that's this is how the world came to be. And there are other people like uh, Michael Denton, which take a very Aristotelian view, which in other words, is just saying that there's something very, very purposeful wired into the fabric of the universe and it all unfolds in some sort of naturalistic manner what probably most intelligent design people would agree with is that you cannot understand biology unless you adopt a mindset like an engineer or an architect or even an artist or a mechanic. Um, it, it, it would be impossible to understand it just as pure physics and chemistry. Um, and so um, I, I kind of parted ways with the intelligent design camp, um, politically, you would say, and I aligned myself more with the third wave evolution people, but I'm still an engineer, <laughs> okay? And, 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 and uh, in fact, it's because I'm an engineer and uh, engineers build things. And engineers, uh, if, if a scientist tells, a story that sounds plausible to some people doesn't mean it's going to sound plausible to an engineer. Joanna is an engineer too. I learned that at lunch today, and that was another point in your favor. <laughs> and and, and, and one of the things that I think has been happening in the last few years is the bad blood has kind of cooled off. There's, there's a lot less of that going on there are some very there's there's been bullying voices uh in the space that have gone silent yeah and that's opened up a lot more conversation and so i felt like today would be a perfect opportunity to have 
Like we don't have a plan for where this conversation <laughs> is going to go. I know Paul has a couple things he's probably going to want to talk about. I have a couple things I have in mind. And Joanna, you probably have a few things, but, but we did not script this out. We just felt like it would be really good to have this conversation. And, and uh, Joanna hasn't hardly said anything yet. Let's, let's start with, um, uh, can you tell us um, a, 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 like how this conversation evolved from your perspective and you know, you mentioning Signature in the Cell and you appreciated some things about that book. Why don't you get us started, Joanna? Sure. Oh, hi everyone. I'm so happy to be here. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, Perry. It's great to meet Paul. Um, I am an engineer, but I'm a bioengineer. It's something that is very new. I actually was part of the first cohort of graduates in bioengineering in the University of Porto. Mm -hmm. And that's part of, uh, I think, my advantage, but also what set me on a black hole arsenal of where did this all come from, right? Because I want to know. <laughs> uh, so because all other engineers can build, can put their systems apart and not, and we were just left in awe at the wonders of nature. So just, just to put that uh, clear. Um, I am very interested in debating and talking with everyone. And I think this is a problem of current society that we have closed our ears to some views with which we disagree with. And I am pro dialogue, uh, civil dialogue. So <laughs> I am very happy to be here and this is a great opportunity. However, uh, I am not a philosopher of science. And I think a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are more on the side of philosophy than science itself. So I will try to do my best, uh, but I will also express a lot of ignorance and questions mostly. Um, I, I do science on the origin of life. Um, there are many different ways to do science, uh, observation, experimentation, simulation, um, but th this is what I do. And that's what I'm most comfortable talking about. But I'm very, very excited to discuss ideas and concepts. I'm not a philosopher though, but I, I understand you are a philosopher, Paul, so. Well, I'll tell you, when I turned in the first drafts of my dissertation at Chicago, my committee said, uh, remember, Paul, this is supposed to be a philosophy dissertation. So I am probably much more of a frustrated biologist than I am a philosopher. <laughs> Um, the fact is, I could get a fellowship as a philosopher and be a dissenter from mainstream evolutionary theory. That would be impossible in a biology program. So philosophers sort of get a card that says you're allowed to be a little bit crazy. And uh, all the way back to Plato, right? You, you're allowed to ask annoying questions. When I have a chance to read, uh, it's all biology. I rarely read philosophy journals. Um, and I'm a philosopher of science to the extent that many of the problems that we have with scientific theories aren't really in the empirical aspect, they're in the conceptual foundations. So I wanna plug your paper again. Long before you, know, you did the podcast with Perry, uh, I mean, this goes back a long, almost 10 years now. I read this paper. I was so excited about it. We'll put it, a reference in the show notes. It's called Systems Biology Perspectives on Minimal and Simpler Cells by Joanna Javier. Thank you. My English was not nearly as good as this today back then, just <laughs> to say. <laughs> um, I was telling Perry at lunch that uh, infrequently, I wish it happened more often, I'll read a paper and it's so beautifully organized and, and insightful that I remember the author's name and I watch for it, right? Oh. So I read this paper, I immediately sent the PDF to a bunch of my coworkers uh, who were thinking of along similar lines, how to define a minimal cell. And what I liked about the paper was it was analytically thorough. In other words, you, you come at the problem from multiple dimensions, top down, bottom up, middle out. Um, it's, it's, you know, well 
well based in the existing literature at the time. And your name stuck in my head. And I, I'm gonna, I, I said to myself, I'm gonna watch for what else she does. I love the way she thinks. I love the way she writes. So, you know, I, I see you. notes about Perry's podcast. So of course, I, you know, jump on my laptop immediately. And um, the best scientists are philosophers without even trying to be, right? Because of the way that they think. So if you look, for instance, at Einstein's miracle year, 1905, the special relativity paper, for instance, it's filled with philosophical analysis of, for instance, the concept of simultaneity. He has to clear up simultaneity to, to move physics from where it was stuck to where it needed to be. Uh, when I read Francis Crick uh, or Jacques Monod, same thing. They're doing philosophy because they're down in the concepts. So whether you like it or not, you're already a philosopher. Thank you. I, I sometimes say I'm an amateur philosopher, but um, my supervisors in my PhD back when I wrote that paper, uh, they had to, to to tame me, so to say, because I was, I, I just wanted to talk about concepts and origins and they were more, they were engineers and they were more interested in the apl applicability of chassis cells, minimal cells for bioproduction. So yeah, um, I, I've been taming myself since then because <laughs> it's, it's usually easier to debate science uh, than philosophy, but that paper, it, I wish I, I have a picture actually, I wish I could show you, but I can't right now, but it was hard work. It was months of my table. I was lucky to have a big dining table at the time. Yeah. And it was filled with papers in different piles. Like, what is this? What is that? Like, be trying to piece out the literature. It was hard work. And it, it's good to be a PhD student because you actually have the time to do that. Right. Well, there's an expression in the movie business. All the money in the budget is on the screen. Right. They didn't waste any money. It's all there. And all the hard work is here in the paper, right? Hard work shows itself in, in, Thank quality, you. in quality. So um, uh, I, think that, I think that many of the issues around design and, and let's call it reductionism and so forth really don't have to do so much with evidential questions. I mean, we can say, the diploid chromosome number of Homo sapiens is 46, right? Uh, you know, uh, bacteria turn out to have histone-like proteins. Who knew? But there the data are. We can settle on pretty much what the data show. Where we run into problems and, and obstacles is when, for instance, one's person conception of an explanation, the nature of explanation itself diverges from another person's. Um, and I've run into this constantly dealing with evolutionary biologists for whom design by its very nature cannot be a scientific explanation. And that's not really an empirical question, right? That's a question of what is the nature of, of this enterprise that we're mm -hmm. embarking on. Mm -hmm. um, so in our email exchanges, you were asking some questions that I found very hard to answer because I don't have quick soundbite answers for them, but they're good questions. <laughs> um, one in particular that sticks in my mind is you said, it can't be the case that you just say, God put prokaryotes on planet earth. Underlying that, I hear a voice saying, that's not what I would consider a satisfying, empirically sufficient account, right? It's an act of magic. And uh, I agree with you, right? And one of the problems I find with intelligent design is it's been kind of an unruly teenager, a noisy, <laughs> unruly teenager who criticizes everybody, right? Comes home from their first semester at college and they're smarter than everyone in the room and everyone's ideas are bad and criticize this, criticize that. And it's not... Uh, it's not a mature theory. It's not a mature discipline. So when Perry and I were at lunch, I was explaining to him that one of the things that I'm happy about is intelligent design seems to be growing up. Uh, 
And I was hoping that you would be at this meeting in Israel last year. That wasn't able to happen. There's going to be another one in 2024, and I hope you'll be able to go to that one. But this maturing process is happening. And I, I'd like to talk about that a little bit, but I don't want to talk too much. So, um, well, I can step in, in here. Um, and I, I felt when, when I came into this space, and my brother, says, I, I'm not going to be a missionary anymore. And we have to argue about the hand at the end of his arm and, and uh, natural selection and evolution. I'd never been down the evolution hole. That was in 2004, which was really close to the boiling yeah, point yeah. of politically in the United States of this stuff. And, um, and I, well, I, it only took me about two weeks to figure out you're not going to get to the bottom of this reading popular books that you buy at Barnes and Noble. <laughs> you're going to have to read scientific papers and you're going to have to really roll up your sleeves and understand this stuff. And, and so um, I, I was I mean, to, to an engineer, everything in biology looks designed and it looks mm. so designed that Richard Dawkins defined biology as the study of things that appear to be designed. Okay. And, 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 uh, and in Darwin's theory of natural selection doesn't explain anything because you have to have a design before there's anything to select. So that like people think that 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 that's answered the question and it really it really hasn't. And and so where where my curiosity just went on jet fuel was when I discovered people like uh, Lynn Margulis and Barbara McClintock and and James Shapiro, who I'm now friends with, um, and that there was this whole other viewpoint, which has been called the third way of evolution, which is that organisms design themselves and redesign themselves, and it's very empirical. And um, I felt at the, when, when I discovered that, first of all, I was like, why didn't anybody tell me about mm. this? Why did it take me two years of bumping around and reading all over the place before I found any of this? How come they're not shouting this from the rooftops? And this is actually much more impressive than any magic act. When, when, I, when I saw that Barbara McClintock figured out that a corn plant can edit its own DNA and repair it in real time, I was like, this is way more impressive than anything at Ken Ham's Creation Museum. <laughs> Why aren't people talking about this? And I, yeah. I felt like I got resistance. And one, one of the criticisms I made in, in my Evolution 2.0 book, I said, I said, I read a Richard Dawkins book like Greatest Show on Earth. I read Signature in the Cell, and neither of these books tell me about this kind of stuff. <laughs> they both make like symmetrical, identical omissions from the opposite point of view, and they both ignore this middle part. And this middle part is much deeper. And so if, if you said to me, so Perry, how do you solve the origin of life? I go, I don't know. And it's flipping really, really hard. But I am not, <laughs> it's like flipping hard. <laughs> but I am not willing to go, so, okay, so God did it. So so, so people, people like Joanna are doing the heavy lifting. And they are taking, they are taking on one maybe possibly the hardest science problem in existence and it's very slow going and there's not enough funding and it's a very fragmented field and worse i would say 80 percent of the people in the origin of life field make up three-fourths of the story and fill in the rest with facts hmm. it's, it's slowly changing it's slowly changing. <laughs> and, and so you, so you have this hard, narrow road. And I think what we're here to talk, you get, you guys help me out and see if you agree, but I think what we're here to talk about is how does a design perspective 
make doing better science possible and not shortcut the science into acts of magic. And, and how does a, a practicing scientist or even an engineer scientist or a bioengineer or whatever we want to call ourselves, how do we do better science because we have a design view and not short circuit the, the scientist's job with the God of the gaps argument? I don't like God of the gaps arguments because it takes a job away from a scientist. And I've been around too long to think, that we need to take jobs away from scientists. I think scientists are incredibly useful. We need the profession. We need them to be as productive as possible. And, and we can't give them the finger and say, God did it. And so that's my set of rules for engaging this conversation. But I'm an engineer and I see engineering in my hand and in my eye and everywhere and in, in, in every cell. So here it's, it's, it's like we're in this paradox or the, there's this tension between the naturalistic and the, um, the metaphysical. And I'll say one more thing. To some people, metaphysical is four-letter word. <laughs> but hang on. Does the number seven exist? Uh, how much does it weigh? How big is it? Where is it? Where tell, tell me, where is the number seven? Well, there's probably a number seven in every single book in this library. If not, if seven doesn't exist, why are why are sevens everywhere? That's right. <laughs> and why do why do we use them every day? But, but, so this this said, so that means that ideas are metaphysical. Math mathematics is met, metaphysical. Logic is metaphysical. So you can never get around this. You you end up you're doing metaphysics no matter what your worldview is. And, and that, that's what Paul was saying. Like, even the, the worst philosopher is the scientist who doesn't know he's a philosopher because he's just repeating a philosophy <laughs> that somebody gave him and never examined. So that, that's my piece. Where would you guys like to go from here? Well, um, let me start with God of the Gaps because that is, I would say, near the top of the complaints that working scientists have with what they see to be intelligent design. And if design were simply jamming uh, a transcendent mind into every open puzzle in nature, I wouldn't be involved in it. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I, in fact, I don't believe that's what it is. But I think we need to recognize that the questions we put to nature determine the research that we undertake. And this is an analogy, I'll sketch an analogy that I've used with students that I find very helpful. Suppose the question I put to nature is, how can I have real-time communication with someone on Mars? So, Joanna, you're in London right now? Yes. All right, so we're in real-time communication, thank God. All right. Uh, it's 20 years from now, and Elon Musk has invested quite a bit of money in a Martian colony. It's doing well. There are a lot of people up there working. I have my 20-year-plus version of my iPhone, and I'm, in, I'm retired. I have a nephew who's working up there. And so I want to you know, take my iPhone and punch in his number and have a conversation just the way that we are now. So my science question is, how can I have real-time communication with a Mars dweller? And I put this to the National Science Foundation. And instead of funding my proposal, they give me a textbook on basic physics. And they say, unless we totally do not understand the speed of light, of electromagnetic radiation, right? Time that takes for a signal. It's never going to be real time. It will be at best like a six minute, seven minute round trip, a very leisurely conversation. So not every question we put to nature is going to have an answer in the terms that we prefer. So let me now apply the analogy to the origin of life. What if it's the case uh, that organisms did not become in the sense of the, the standard theoretical pathway of chemistry, to self-organizing systems, to true cells. 
So the question that the origin of life research community is putting to nature is what was that pathway from chemistry to self-organizing systems to true cells? What if that's not what happened? Then it doesn't matter how sincere we are. It doesn't matter how many times we ask the question or how much money we put into it. If we're not listening to what nature is trying to tell us, there is no knowledge to put in that gap. And it wouldn't be a God of the gaps to say you're jamming a transcendent mind into an open puzzle. What I would say is change the questions you put to nature. What if organisms are, they don't become? Now that that's terrifying in a certain sense. If the question that I have been presupposing is there's a natural pathway from chemistry to the, to the cellular state. So I think the God of the gaps is a problem insofar as there's a background theory against which one expects to have knowledge to fill in certain open puzzles. But if the background theory is erroneous or in some way misconceiving nature, what you need to do at that point is change your question. Um, now, okay. no one, let me just, last, last, my yeah. last sentence, <laughs> no one gives up a good question, especially in science. No one readily surrenders a good valid question if they're not given anything in exchange for that, right? So if I ask someone, give up that question, that question is ill-conceived, I have the obligation of providing them with something that is deeper, more satisfying, more illuminating of nature. So I understand, Joanna, if, you're, if you are committed to that question, you, you produce beautiful work in trying to answer it, but maybe it's putting the wrong question to nature. So I'll shut up. Great. Well, so many things to talk about. Uh, where do I start? Um, I'll try to, to circle back to some things that Barry said, but I'll, I'll catch you right uh, at the end. Um, if we say that prokaryotes just are as an alternative, the question becomes, what is the science to be done to explain them? And if they just are, I don't see any research alternative, but you can, you can tell me later if you have some thoughts there. But I agree that some questions, new questions need to be asked and some new paths need to be taken. I guess I'm just not that extreme. <laughs> I find a middle way. And the middle way is related to something that Perry was talking about before which are new discoveries in molecular biology, genetics, biochemistry that have been deeply, deeply ignored. Um, alternative ways of thinking of the origin of life as not a self-replicating single molecule leading to all, but as a complex system that slowly becomes more complex. Um, the theory of evolution is almost 200 years old. Somehow it caught us so deeply because it said, we don't need religion anymore. And everyone is still a teenager in humanity at that point. And they're like, cool, no religion. We can go party with science now. And th this is a problem because now we need to take the next step and we need to look at the new science. But somehow people got really stuck on that and they ignored Barbara McClintock for years and they just recognized her work very, very recently. We're talking a few decades. Uh, even though she did her work a, a long time ago, less than 100 years, but more decades than what we, we are paying attention to it now. So I say, let's look at new things that we're learning about cells. Let's try to find different types of cells. Let's look at self-organization, at collectives, instead of single self-replication genes or molecules. Let's look at emergence and not just selection. Let's look at cooperation and not just competition because there's a lot to look at. It may not be sufficient in my lifetime, but I think it's very exciting. <laughs> and I think we're, learn, we're going to learn a lot about life on the way. However, if you tell me, here's an alternative way of thinking that isn't just they are, because I don't know what to do with that. You know, I don't know what science we can do with that. Yeah, I guess um, it's more or less what I want. Yeah. No, I, I listen, I 
It's, it's interesting and kind of paradoxical in a way that I find all kinds of insights in reading the origin of life literature, because in a sense, I wish I could think of a good analogy. It's like sketching the negative space around a shadow where if you take a certain set of assumptions about the origin of life, you're still looking at nature and she's still talking back to you, right? Um, I'm very struck when I look at prebiotic chemistry that, for instance, the, the chemical processes that produce amino acids, as you know, they produce hundreds of them of both handedness, right? And yet when we come to living things, it's a set of, well, depending on how you count, 20 or 22 with pyrolysine and selenocysteine. Um, a, a selection out of this huge pool of alternatives that, that I do not want to invoke contingency. I do not want to invoke a natural miracle, so to speak. Well, that's just the way, you know, that's just the way it happened. When I read Crick on um, the 68 paper on the origin of the genetic code, it's the famous frozen accident paper. He comes to the very end and he says, well, that was my idea, but I really don't find it satisfactory. So he's criticizing his own, his own account. And he says, the problem is by invoking a frozen accident, you effectively make chance, a, a singularity, do all the work. And he's, he, as a, as a philosophical naturalist, is unhappy with his own theory. So my experience in interacting with origin of life researchers, most recently in Israel in, in May of last year, is that somewhere deep inside themselves, they're not happy with their own accounts. They find them insufficient. And my hunch is that, that they have some sense that the question, go back to my metaphor, putting a question to nature, the question that they're putting to nature is missing something very important. So I am really interested in what you can come up with, with, for instance, notions of collectives, um, notions of co cooperative, co cooperativity, uh, not starting with a single ribozyme. Um, but we, we've just met. Here's a prediction. I think what will happen in the next five to 10 years, as you go further down this road, you will find uh, empirically that there is a lower threshold of complexity. And you, you begin to describe this in the 2014 paper, <laughs> there's a lower threshold of complexity below which the cell as a system ceases to be. And even before I read your paper, uh, in 1999, this paper from uh, the Venter group, uh, Saturation Mutagenesis of Mycoplasma, and then John Glass, first author, they redid it in 2006 in PNAS. That experiment of perturbing the DNA sequence of the simplest free living bacterial cell that we know is clearly mapping this, this threshold below which you do not have a living state. What if that threshold isn't just a consequence of history? What if it's actually what it means to be a cell? And I think it is. I think it is what it means to be a cell. Okay, so I think it is. Can yeah. I get to amplify on that because Sorry? I find that very significant. Can expand. Yes. On yes. I mean, I started there. I I started there, as you say, in 2014. I was already there. I was like, gosh, there is a minimal level of complexity for this, but I can't believe it appeared by magic. There is also, uh, as you say, there is a a low level of complexity at, at which the cell ceases to exist, there's the same for a volcano. It's just much less complex in a cell, but it is an emergent property. It needs a set of conditions and then poof, you have a volcano. You also have it in planets without life and we can explain them. In terms of the collectives, it's always a collective. That's what I'm always telling my students. You never have anything that is not a collective. An atom is made of quarks. <laughs> and in life, it's very important because we always need to think of the cell and the environment. So there's always that collective. And there is, will always be in any set of molecules that self-rearrange and start to organize. Now, you said origin of life scientists are not happy with their accounts. No one has an account. It's a mystery. 
it's a $10 million, poten as Perry knows, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars worth mystery. No one has an account. <laughs> we, just, we just pretend we do because that's what we're told to do to get our positions because we need to be the experts, right? No one wants to talk about ignorance and humility. And this is a big problem. But if I, I can bring us back to design and intelligent design and a different way to look at what design is and to get out of that teenager rejection of design just because it's church, right? <laughs> I, think, well I think we need, I think we need to, to start thinking about design as having a plan. In, in that way, maybe we can just, it's okay, you know? Cells, have, cells model their environment. So that's having a plan. We just do it with a brain, which is like, wow, now we can design, right? So what I find really interesting in most atheists, hardcore materialists that reject design, they don't even want to talk about it. It's like, you accept that our brain does design naturalistically, but you don't that cells do. It's just a much more complex way to plan, to model, to design. But cells can do models of the environment and what's happening. Uh, and we need to learn more about how they plan, how they well, execute I, plans, right? Maybe that's it. <laughs> well, you know, um, at lunch, uh, Perry and I were talking about Michael Levin's work. And uh, I sent him an email a couple of weeks ago. I can remember where I was during COVID, listening to a podcast on my AirPods oh, during a winter day, like today here in Chicago, walking, listening to him talk about his view of the nature of cognition, not just in brains, but in bacteria, right? And it, I, you know, it gave me chills. I, you know, it was one of those vivid moments where you think, why didn't I hear about this during four Again. years, you know, and, and, you know, many years of graduate training? Why am I hearing about this now? This belongs at the center of biology. Um, it's interesting that in theology, you can talk about someone having a high or low view of the Bible. In a high view of the Bible, it's full of riches that you need to carefully extract. The low view says, well, it's just cobbled together over time and it's not really that interesting of a document. Right. Well, you can have a high and a low view of living things. I have a very high view of living things that they are incredibly, beyond our description, transcendentally sophisticated in their design, right down to mycoplasma, right? Mycoplasma, which <laughs> if I can ascribe some cognition to that genus just jettisoned a whole bunch of internal hardware because its normal environment is the epithelia of our airway or our genital tract. Why do I need amino acid at building machinery? I can get them from the environment. So it's got a very clever strategy of making a living as an obligate parasite, right? I take, you know, another bacteria, I look at another bacterial or archaeal group in a hot spring in Yellowstone Park here in the United States or in an Arctic zone, and their internal molecular complexity is enormous. They have to do everything for themselves, right? So, you, you know, you look at these microbial groups and they are very sophisticated. You talk about mirroring your environment. If, if you're mycoplasma, you're like a, a spoiled rich kid living with your, your aunt, you know, in Palm Springs and she, she brings you a sandwich and she brings you a cell phone and whatever, you know, and, and take that same spoiled rich kid and put him in a helicopter and drop him in an Arctic zone. He's in big trouble. So I, I, I have a high view of living things. And I think this is a place, Joanna, where your work and the work of other people in the origin of life community is so helpful to me as a design theorist because in a sense, we are converging on the same set of objects. You're doing it with a certain analytical lens. I'm doing it with a, with a different analytical, analytical lens, but the natural object is what it is. And if we listen to it, if I can again personify nature, she talks back to us. Um, 
And I, I, I just, I brought this book along. It's the philosophy of science book. And I wanted to read one short passage. I got Perry's permission to do this because it goes back to this God of the gaps problem. And the problem that I see that you've expressed very articulately, which is saying prokaryotes just are is not satisfactory. So I want the parallel here is with the transition from Aristotelian physics to Galilean physics, and eventually to what we saw in Newton. So just a few sentences. The first major step toward a new physics was taken by Galileo with the introduction of the concept of inertial motion. If a terrestrial body were in motion with no forces acting on it, it would continue its motion indefinitely. This thesis, once accepted, eliminates the old problem of projectile motion. The idea that objects have a natural motion remains, so that carries over from Aristotle. But in the case of terrestrial objects, natural motion is no longer finite but indefinite. Now here's the key phrase. And it becomes necessary to explain why motion stops rather than why it continues. If you look at Aristotelian physics, it was a problem to explain why the arrow kept going. And what Galileo does is he reverses that. And he says the arrow would go forever unless there were other forces acting on it. So it's, it's, re, it's what Thomas Kuhn calls picking up the other end of the stick. You rotate the problem around, and in doing that, you change your perspective on what questions need to be answered. So when I read your work, I see a description of a state of nature that may be irreducible. And if you look at the history of origin of life research, going back to Oberyn and Haldane, one way to read that history is that we've run one self-organization theory, one chemistry first theory after another at this, at this natural object. And in, in so doing, we are, we are discovering that if you want cells, you have to have cells. Now, where you go from there, I don't know. But I, I need to stop talking. I'm talking too much. But I think a kind of perspectival shift on a parallel to what I described from, from the transition from Aristotelian to Galilean physics is may, maybe what motivates a lot of my colleagues within intelligent design. They don't want a God of the gaps theory because they themselves recognize it's not satisfactory. But they, they're confronted with what if, what if to have a cell, you need a cell. So you mentioned Dennis Noble. You actually held up his book. I, I read that book when it first came out. And again, it was one of those moments where I could see where I was sitting. I was waiting for my daughters to pick them up after a badminton practice, sitting in my car and I'm reading this. And it's, it's electrifying because this is very, very good biology, but it's not reductionist. Um, so when you, held up, when you held up that book, I'm thinking, well, this is yet another place where we're intersecting. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Um, would you say you have a good idea of the panorama in ID right now? Would you say that most people are good with evolution now and they're just pointing to the origin of life? Like they went down all the path and they're like, this is the only place where, I mean, they, they of course say ID propagates to the tree, I guess, but would you say most people accept the theory of evolution? Well, it depends what you mean by evolution. I'm, I'm a student of evolutionary theory, right? I would say if you gave me Douglas Fatuma's evolutionary biology textbook, 80% of that I would incorporate into an intelligent design textbook. Mm -hmm. where, where are the areas where I would have a disagreement? They're the places where it looks like there is a, a, an original discontinuity. So, um, and those discontinuities typically within evolutionary are, evolutionary theory are explained by singularities. Right. So let's get, let me give you an example that, that will bring us together because uh, I know you know about this area, the origin of the eukaryotic cell. So you were in Bill Martin's lab as a postdoc, right? Mm -hmm. 
If you read Bill Martin on that event, that original event, he says it had a probability akin to the origin of the solar system or the origin of life itself, once in 5 billion years. And if you ask him, and I've read quite a bit of his work, if you ask him, how did that happen? How did an archaeal cell engulf an alpha proteobacterium? He doesn't know. Nobody does. It is a, an effect, a natural miracle. I do not find that satisfactory. And over and over in evolutionary theory, along the chronicle from the first cell to Homo sapiens, you have the invocation of singularities, meaning events with exceedingly small probabilities that have to happen in effect to hold together the clade eukarya or to hold together the metazoa, right? Okay, um, I see. So uh, I, I'm trying to answer your question. I, I would say most of evolutionary theory makes perfect sense to me. What does not make perfect sense are these these events for which there is no natural model and no understanding. Um, I mean, we, we do have a much better model for eukaryogenesis and for the origin of life, I think, uh, especially recently with a lot of discoveries on weird archaea that have tentacles and can like probably engulf stuff. Um, the question of probability, I don't think there are many people in the world that know more about eukaryogenesis than Bill Martin, but the question of probability is always one that leaves me unease, uneasy because we don't have the numbers to calculate those probabilities. We don't know how much is stochastic, how much contingency we're missing. We don't know in that environment, what was the likelihood, what were the cells back then? We only have what we see now. And I think we are in Plato caves all of us, the ones very materialistic, the ones that say it's too irreducible, so there's no way. We, we just have to continue push at the walls and like, is there a way out? Like, can I see where my walls are? And can I identify those walls and try to push beyond and perhaps look at some other people's walls as well? Um, That's yeah, why but I, I Dialogue is so important. Yes, yes. And I think we agree on much more than, than disagree. Some people will be disappointed. They probably expected more fiery discussion. <laughs> so how, how can I learn? Perry, when... Perry so wants to say, yeah. One of my frustrations when I, when I started to get my feet solidly on the ground and understand what all the different positions were was I felt like everybody was invoking a miracle and only the creationists were admitting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it. It really pissed me off. Like I'm reading an origin of life book and, and, it, and it says, and suddenly the DNA became the template for its own. And, and, and it was, and I'm a marketing guy too. And it, it was like, like he, he did this, he did this sleight of hand thing, which I picked up instantly because I'm a marketing guy. And it happens, I'm like, this isn't, this isn't engineering. This isn't science. This is either advertising or religion. In a okay. And, and, and listen, it's okay to, I'm all for advertising and I'm all for religion. As long as you're honest about what you're doing. Or as long as it says, you know, this is a sponsored link. Okay. <laughs> but but you, you touched on the right point because the biggest pressure we get to do that is from funding agencies and the way that funding agencies ask us to write proposals and the right. way that we are evaluated. And this is a very hard problem. We talked about it before, but it's just the, the way we judge merit objectively is it's very, very hard. So people have resorted to these things and, and also to become a public speaker and to be, you know, known in the media and be called to speak in the media. You need to, to you know, like shine, shine your expertise out. And then people just say whatever they want to say. I've heard physicists that have no knowledge of biology saying, oh, the origin of life, you know, they figured that out. <laughs> oh, and it, it gets my nerves too, Barry. I know what you mean. Yeah. So. If you can get people to lay down their weapons, 
and be honest about their presuppositions. And if, if we can have an honest, respectful conversation, I th it, it, it moves us better, much, much more effectively when, when in the process of writing Evolution 2.0, which took six years, and then there was, there was another four years before I even started. I, I came to believe that every single con, um, faction, no matter how kooky they seem to be, they all had something useful to say. Hmm. Okay, so I'm not very fond of young earth creationists, but in the beginning, it was information by, the, by Werner Gitt who is a young earth creationist is a fantastic book. Um, I'm not really into um, panspermia, but I think if, if ignore, ignore the panspermia guys at your peril because they ask really interesting questions and they come up with really interesting chemistry. And every now and then they show you something that you would never come up with any other way. And, 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 and so my approach has been, well, let's put on the table, what do we know? Now, now here's, uh, there, there's, there's a book that came out about 20 years ago called The Privileged Planet by Guillermo Gonzalez. And uh, Jay Richards. And Jay Richards. Right, yeah. Now, Guillermo Gonzalez was a professor at Iowa State, and, and he basically got his career trashed by writing this book. Right. Now, but, but here's what the book said. And, and I've, I, I took this as a cue and I've, I've ran with it ever since. So he was going to India, I believe, to watch a solar eclipse that was happening in India, but it wasn't happening other places. And they were trying to observe the sun's corona, which you can only observe during a, a perfect solar eclipse and at no other time. And he was like, gee, it's really, really interesting that the sun and the moon are exactly the same size in the sky to, from the point of view of a human observer, which makes it possible to observe the corona and make all these calculations and learn things about stars that you couldn't learn any other way. Gee, it's almost like the sun and the moon are supposed to be the same size so that we could observe it. And guess what? We're at the right place in the Milky Way galaxy and the one right part of a spiral arm, and we can see almost the entire universe, which if you picked most random places in the universe, you wouldn't be because there'd be a big bright star nearby or there'd be a big nebula or something. You couldn't see anything. And he came to the conclusion, the, the cosmos is designed for observation and, and understanding, which coincidentally also makes it receptive and possible for life to exist, that all of these things go together. And I thought that is a very transcendent way of looking at the world. Now he was the, 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 the reductionist drove him out of town. He, he was laughed at, he was scorned. He didn't get tenure, he had to leave. It was really ugly. But, but he made a great point. And, and I have, ever since I, I read that book, I have operated with the assumption that, that the universe is designed to be discovered and to be discoverable, which is why I believe that at least in principle, there is a solution to the origin of life question that is actually understandable. So, so to, to, to say it more explicitly, I believe God made the world so that we could understand it. And, and I, I believe that, the, that miracles happen when we can observe them, not when we can't. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually believe in miracles. I've been, I've been in the room twice when deaf people were prayed for and got their hearing back. And both had been deaf for more than 30 years. And I have... Um, I have an inner, I have an interview with one of them and the other ones, that's a whole other conversation, but I, I've seen things happen. My perspective on acts of magic, which you talked about at the beginning, 
My perspective on acts of magic is there are acts of magic that you can see. And if it happened a million years ago, it's not an act of magic. It's something that you can understand through some kind of a process. And, and so, and, and so, okay, so what do we do? The next step is we're, we're faced with this huge problem. Like you have the left-handed chirality of, of these molecules and, and, and various, there's, there's about a hundred thousand questions kind of like that, <laughs> that nobody knows the answer to. So start, what are you pretending not to know? Or what do you know that you're ignoring? And the first place that I go to is psychic phenomena. Hmm. There's 120 years, maybe 140 years of literature. There's good literature. Princeton University proved that people could deflect falling balls by concentrating by a measurable amount. And they proved it with 99.999%, five, five nines of, of statistical confidence. Well, look, if a person by concentrating can deflect a, a falling ball, then there is a principle of consciousness interacting with matter that nobody understands. Now, what if that principle is the secret to the origin of life? And what if consciousness comes first and matter comes second, not the other way around? That's been the religious view of most religions um, since the beginning of dirt. Yeah. The, the I, idea that matter comes first and consciousness comes second is a very, very recent idea. Hmm. And it's not working out very well. Yeah. And, and there's also the simple fact that everyone accepts that there are constants in the universe that they seem to be very well adjusted to what we see as the universe. But then, of course, we have some people coming talking about multiverses for which we have no evidence, but still. Well, that's uh, okay. And that's metaphysics. And it's okay. Yeah. As long as it's you, okay. Yes. As long as yes you, absolutely. Truth, absolutely. Truth in packaging. Joanna, may, yeah. may I ask you a question? Yes, sure. Um, uh, hypothetical. What would a really adequate a biogenesis account look like to you um, in terms of its empirical content. So you can think of a you can think of your work and the work of, of other origin of life researchers as you're on a hunt, you're on a search for something. Well, to do a hunt, to do a search, you have to have a target state, something that you're aiming for. So 10 years, 15, 20 years down the road, or at some point in the future, what would you say, or can you describe, that's what I was looking for and now I found it? Hmm. Gosh, that's a very good question. Um, but it's almost like asking, I guess, an engineer how he would see a plane without wings and you know something that you, you have not seen. but. Um, I think, and now in very specific terms, if I see uh, collectively autocatalytic systems of, of proteins and nucleic acids encapsulated in, in a membrane that can divide without a giant code, but just an autocatalytic system that can grow, that includes proteins, nucleic acid, and membrane, and of course, all the small molecules, uh, I think I would be very happy to see that. Um, what would be the, I, what would be the, the, that would be the end state. What would be the, the beginning state chemically along which that would, that entity would come into existence? In other words, would you begin with phosphorus and nitrogen and so forth? Where would that story start? That story starts in the beginning of the universe with all the information contained there already. As Perry said, I think what God is or what nature is, uh, is very related to that point, right? That it, everything started some time and what happens now was pretty much defined. A lot of it was defined there, I think. I'm going to <laughs> metaphysics then. <laughs> uh, but it starts then. It starts then. And then you need yeah. planets and then you need... You know, you need a whole path. 
I didn't explain um, my I didn't explain my follow up question adequately. I'm assuming that what you're describing that um, that autocatalytic system with proteins, nucleic acids, and membrane, small molecules, and so forth, that that would be experimentally demonstrated. In other words, yes. okay, so uh, I, I thank, thank you for your answer about starting at the beginning of the universe, but under experimental conditions, would you try to model uh, a, a geologically realistic early earth and demonstrate a pathway from that state to your your target state. I just I this the reason I ask this is that um, my my next question to you is what would you want from a theory of design? Because mm. I see these two questions as deeply related. Mm. Uh, that one, I, that one in a sense is the mirror of the other, mm. uh, or the reverse image of the other, if you will. I think I, I will get back to, to the first part of your question. I think now I got it better, but from design, I would like a deep, serious epi epistemological exploration of what design, modeling, simulation, cognition is. And so that we may appease uh, the hearts of some very hurt teenage <laughs> people that are, really against uh, even talking, even mentioning it. I think we need uh, to provide them with some conceptual, um, you know, link. The, the way to bridge these worlds is through philosophy and is through serious philosophy. Um, now, from that's what very, I- That's very helpful. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. I think we need some like academic way. Just ignore the science related to biology. Just tell me what design is and what you see, and then use it. You know, you can use examples, much simpler examples. If you if you consider that design is modeling or planning, there are much simpler examples. Yeah, D design yeah. is when conception precedes embodiment. Mm. Yeah, then, then what is conception? And then can conception just be a genome? Can it be a genome that represents the environment that is ready to deal with it? And can we change our readiness? And can, can we change what do we need? What Again, what's the minimal system for, for that? And can we envisage an even simpler system for that? So that's that's a way I think to to engage with design is that like let's let's understand what we're talking about. We're not talking about God of the Gaps or right. Right. prokaryotes by magic or zebras by magic, right? right. I, I, somebody also needs to point out that humans have not proven that they're better designers than bacteria. <laughs> we have not proven that we're smarter than bacteria. How? Yeah. how how do you know that a bacteria is not every bit as smart as a human? Now, like I've, I've been in the cancer field now for three years. Uh, give me one oncologist that's smarter than a tumor. I haven't met one. So, so yeah. literally cells are smart. And so, yeah, they, they, they have been, especially if you consider the whole of the biosphere, it has been modeling Earth and itself since the origin of life. What we're doing as a collective is continue to build better models. And I think that's actually where evolution led us. We're, we're, I think we'll get there. And now we have brains. We can actually do models like pretty good. We're, we just tend to get stuck on some concepts and some animosity and some deeply ingrained biological traits of tribalism <laughs> um, and ego. And uh, yeah, I think that this, this conversation is, I hope, a sign that we can move on from that. I really hope. Yeah. You were going to answer the, my question about the, this experience. The starting point. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we need to, to think about the geochemical setting be very specific with those. I think we can test several and I think they need to have a certain degree of complexity. So far, the most interesting ones are pools a la Deemer or vents a la Bill Martin, Mike Russell. Uh, there are many names. I'm sorry for the people that I'm not citing, but, yeah, but 
Yeah, Nick Lane, of course, my boss. <laughs> Sorry, it's Nick, I love you. Know <laughs> yeah, here in London, yeah. Um, so we, I like vents for many reasons. I don't have to bother you with that. Um, I, I see them as kind of like terrestrial wombs, so to speak, that allow for the influx in, of liquid and out, and, but they are still stable, but dynamic and protected from the UV. So I, I would like to start there. That would be a starting point for a model. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not very concerned about having the whole way, like all the single molecules. I'm more concerned about how those molecules get together, how right. the first collectives, they start to. And I've been thinking a lot about, let me put this out there in people's minds, biofilms also. So not this idea of like a single cell that is like, whoa, magic, but like kind of like together with the rock, structure that generates complexity and then at some point releases god knows how <laughs> a free living cell yeah that's very helpful and um uh it i find as an exercise intellectually to try to describe the target state helps me in working towards something rather than just kind of wandering and a brownian motion pattern over the whole field, giving giving myself something at least to shoot for. And then also when I'm interacting with other people telling them, well, this is what I'm looking for. So I, at the Discovery Institute, have for several years been pushing my colleagues away from what I call Darwin bashing, which can be addictive. No, I'm serious. You can build a whole, you can build a whole career on attacking mainstream evolutionary theory and occult following. Yeah, we sell a lot of books. Uh, and we, we just need to stop bashing in general. Just stop bashing. <laughs> well, you know what happened is I woke up a few years ago and I realized what if everyone in the world who cared about it said, well, sure, design is possible. What have you got? Right? The last thing you're going to do in that situation is go after Darwin or Stephen Jay Gould again, right? You've got to do the responsible thing of saying, well, this is how I understand nature. This is how I see science is moving forward. So I'm, uh, Perry and I were talking about this at lunch. I've been greatly encouraged that this is getting through and other people, I'm not the only person who has this worry. The younger generation of intelligent design theorists is now much more concerned with getting the theory out of its teenage years into a state of maturity where it's productive on its own, it's yielding knowledge on its own. And uh, I hope at this meeting in Israel in 2024, some of that work can be presented. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of politics hanging around, right? And uh, in some of your, uh, in some of our communications, you talked about the problem of the all too human nature of science, questions of funding, of, of stature, you know, people have very strong opinions and so forth. So I'm, I'm trying to encourage my little crazy crew to do the right thing. Um, and yes, we, there are still bad evolutionary theories that need criticism, but there are bad design theories that need criticism. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, there was, uh, that was, now going back to the beginning again, so I love circling back. It's kind of like what self, cells do, like all feedback. Um, that was another thing I liked uh, in, in Stephen Meyer's book. Um, he really went into the question of what is science? Um, and he, I think, mentioned his, um, was it his supervisor, Kaminga? Marka Kaminga, yes. Yeah, and, she was and, his supervisor. Yeah, I knew her papers and I was so like, oh, wow. He, he, and you know, like what is science? Again, I think design has to, has to like say, this is why we are science. And this is the epistemology behind, this is the philosophy of science behind it. And this here is a good example of how we can think in these terms and why this is a, a valid theory. Yeah. So I so think that will help. We are opening a study center in Cambridge uh, within the next year or so, uh, where we hope to have seminars where people from all different perspectives can come together, sort of agree to leave their weapons at the door, right? You got to check your gun. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I will be uh, lecturing there on uh, orphan genes and other topics of my own research area. And uh, give, will give me an opportunity to swing by London and say hello. So anything that right. we, anything that we can do to, uh, and it's very late in the day in Western culture. I mean, I don't need to rehearse all the problems that that have me worried. The war in Ukraine is, all, you know, sufficient enough. Anything that we can do to accelerate the dialectic, right? You know, that's good. I. I've had this feeling, I don't, I've never voiced this, but I'm interested to know what you think. In the last three or four years, the word polarization has just become this giant thing and COVID just poured kerosene yeah. on, on it and made it worse. It seems to me that cancel culture and polarization were absolutely the norm. They were almost invented in evolutionary biology. And then the rest of the world learned it later. And, and what it seems like is happening is the evolutionary biologists are going, boy, you know, now that the whole world is saturated in polarization and cancel <laughs> culture, um, and now that even us white guys can't get a speaking gig anymore, <laughs> Maybe we should start getting along with each other and having a conversation. Is it possible that I'm right about that? It's it's just sad when people cannot talk anymore. You know, um, I I think there are many wrongs that needed to be right, and I, I I'm a woman in science, and I I know my own experience how some things were tough. Um, but for other people, much worse. And we need to talk about those things and put them out, but we, we cannot just shut anyone up um, because that will be worse. We have the experience in the past and then we become like them. <laughs> then we become like them. So it should, reason needs to prevail, needs reason and love and compassion. And yeah. when those prevail, we'll be in a good place. Wanted to uh, pick up on a comment that Perry made about taking wisdom wherever you can find it. Francis Crick uh, shared an office with Sidney Brenner for many years, and it was jammed floor to ceiling with off prints and papers and books. And someone asked him once, why do you have all this stuff here in your office? And why do you read all these obscure journals? And he said, because biology is a science of detail and there might be a clue. Somewhere in all this pile of paper, there might be the clues that I'm looking for. And I have very much, Perry and I have never talked about this, but I have very much the same approach. I will take wisdom wherever I can find it because it's all too rare and there might be yeah. a clue somewhere. So to, again, yeah. to, to touch on your work and the work of other origin of life researchers, I find it so full of insight and it's really kind of a marvelous mystery to me that two very different approaches can uh, my own way of thinking about biology and then the approach that you have can be so fruitfully combined and illuminating. Um, so uh, I'm expecting, you know, as I watch what you do and your colleagues and your, this, this group of young researchers that you form to find more wisdom that's emerging from that, those projects. Yeah, it's it's just so great. And that I, I wanted to mention all and before, it's just so great when we sit together and talk and you hear the different perspective and the origin of life that is key. When you hear someone like, oh, such a nice detail about geology that I had no idea, but here is another constraint on the problem, right? So as soon as you have, it's like a lot of people say, we'll never know. We'll never know. I'm talking about scientists like hardcore materialists. They, they say, we'll never know. It's just too complex. I'm saying, but we can constrain the problem more and more. And then it will be like, you know, we'll just know more things. And even if we don't know, I think we can keep, and to constrain it, we need a load of knowledge and a load of perspectives. And we can do that for our own lives as well, as much as for science, I think. You're right, they're, and the, the clues the clues are out there. They're and they're everywhere. Yep, yep, and it, it's really a good experience with Olin. Like I, I highly recommend anyone out there, young, doing origin of life science. Um, just 
get in touch. Um, as long as you're doing research, uh, we welcome everyone. <laughs> Do you have any, uh, uh, like an online archive of talks or Zoom meetings that you guys have held? I would love to listen into those if there's anything like that. Unfortunately not, Paul, because everyone is afraid of PIs and older people and they want to speak freely, right? And the the, the older generation is just, um, that's why Olin was created. So we have a safe space to just talk. <laughs> yeah, I have consulted in 300 industries, software companies, bowling alleys, banks, seminar companies, manufacturer, like you name it. And people are more afraid to say what they think in science mm -hmm. than any other profession that I have ever seen. This kind of fear does not exist. Yeah. Chiropractors or bowling alleys or restaurants. Yeah. I, I can tell you, like, I think 10 years ago, a lot of what I know now and a lot of what I talked about today, I would have known and kind of have a good construct back then to talk about, but I would never ever do a podcast like this back then. Now I just don't care anymore. I guess that that comes with a little bit of age, but I, I really, it's it's sad, but it's it's a tough profession. It's not really a job with a lot of prospects being a scientist. The job is become a professor and that's a whole other discussion, right? What it implies, what what is asked of you, the politics of the universities and so on. So it, it's hard and I don't blame people, especially young people, you know, I, we need to create the space for them to be able to express their minds freely and the careers. Yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> Would that be life? I, th I think we need to imagine it every day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and but meanwhile we can try to change the culture. Just speaking to each other about dialogue and inclusion. I think that's that would be great already. Yeah, resp responsibility begins with each person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, that's that's a little bit of a good thing of the whole cancel shenanigans. Like professors are at least not screaming in public <laughs> like they used to do. Like really shouting outside of their lungs in public because then it's on Twitter. So that's good. At least they stop that. They still do it behind closed doors though. So, you know. <laughs> well, you, you, you are referring to real events um, carried out by real people uh, against real other people. So it's, it's not like you're making this up. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Well, this has been fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And thanks. And, uh, I hope to see you on your side of the Atlantic uh, in the near future uh, and get you an invitation to come to the center in Cambridge. It's a beautiful place and going to have a lot of interesting seminars. So uh, I look forward to future future conversations. So, so Paul, if people want to find you, where do they go? They can go to the Discovery Institute and put my name in the search box and uh, that's a good portal for email. They, they will pass it immediately on to me. I will give my contact information. You can put it in the show notes. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you don't get it, an, a response right away, just keep knocking. <laughs> the squeaky wheel gets the grease, as we say. So, And Joanna, how do you want people to find you? Uh, ju just before that, to say thank you, Paul. I hope we meet here. Uh, please do keep in touch. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, people can find me on my website, jcxavier.org. J for Joanna, C for my middle name, xavier.org. And yeah, I'm out there. You can Google me, Twitter, those things. I haven't gotten out of that debacle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you both. Thanks for coming uh, down the expressway and thanks. Thank for you. Thank you, Perry. You're a facilitator. You're a bridge maker. And it's, it's an honor to be here. Great pleasure and gratitude. Thank you.